Okay, thanks for coming. This is a really weird talk. Uh, this is uh, this essentially started as a side project, a something totally unrelated to the stuff I, I normally do. Uh, I got into doing robotics. Uh, we we build a mining robot for this uh, fun NASA competition uh, with students. It's a great you know great way to learn about you know, how to how to actually make an Arduino talk to a motor, how to make the motor do what you want to do. Uh, great opportunity to integrate stuff like 3D printing. So this, so we end up having to fabricate lots of weird parts to build a robot. So this thing has actually mined a bunch of uh, uh, dust. The uh, uh, d dust is actually a surprisingly valuable commodity and uh, super duper common in the solar system. So, so the, uh, uh, the the goal of this talk is to actually just make steel parts out of nothing but basalt dust which seems like a really wacky uh, one-step uh, thing to do. But I, I claim this is actually really important for a bunch of reasons. So uh, in particular, uh, there's almost no way to actually get out there in this space and you know, live, uh, to live an interesting life uh, if, if everything, you're, you're, everything you're eating, everything you're, uh, you're using to, to, to move around, everything, you know, everything comes from Earth, it's just uh, totally uh, they have the same problem Alaska does, but just way, way, way worse, right? That shipping costs totally kill you. You have to be shipping something valuable back in order for it to be, you know, to be, uh, uh, to be keep, uh, keep sending stuff up. And it, uh, I claim this actually, so, so Alaska is just sort of a scale model of space, right? And as far as uh, it being tough to get stuff here, you know, we, we, uh, uh, capital investment, we have this huge sort of material wealth available but there's almost no, uh, you know, industrial infrastructure to uh, to take advantage of it. So the the, the hard part about this is that uh, uh, if you want to make stuff, making stuff is actually really really hard. This is uh, this was uh, a sort of failure over the weekend of basically just starting with a sheet of steel, stainless steel, and I was trying to basically form scoops to dig dust. And uh, forming steel is really difficult, right? This is traditionally done on way bigger presses than I have, and it's usually done with like tool steel dies. Uh, and uh, uh, basically, it, it's, it's actually just, uh, so, so our, our traditional ways of making things are, uh, they're really complicated, they're really capital intensive. So in particular, like if, if you look at like how you make steel, the traditional way to make steel on earth is to just, you know, I, I shovel two kinds of rocks together, right? One is coal and the other is iron ore. And you have to find the right rocks in the right places to shovel them together, and then uh, and, and then we have to we have to blow air through these. Now the problem is it's actually likely that on an asteroid, for example, you'll have none of these. We have no air, no coal, and no iron ore. What you have, right? Iron ore actually, uh, as far as I can tell, a lot of the iron ore on Earth comes from bacteria, sort of cementing these little bits of iron together. Which, in other words, we sh we literally wouldn't expect uh, any of those things on anywhere else in the solar system, which is kind of a problem, right? Uh, and I, I claim this actually doesn't work all that well on Earth either, right? So we we have this sort of extremely carbon-intensive process that uh, that produces all of this sort of waste material, the uh, you know the uh, steel slag. Uh, it's uh, it's super duper. It's it's hard to convey how capital and uh, uh, labor intensive this is. So so a, a micro mill, which is uh, the little picture in the background, is uh, on the order of a quarter billion dollars. It's on the order of 250 people and produces maybe a kiloton of steel a day, which is a lot of steel, right? Two million pounds of steel per day is like sort of hard to hard to comprehend. There's one in Anchorage, and that's the only one in the state. It only makes rebar. Right? Uh, what that means is that anything you want from steel in Alaska has to be shipped in from outside, right? which I, I claim is sort of just this really big long-term uh, problem. Uh, so some simpler process is sort of what I was at. I've been, I've been thinking about this problem for a, a long time. Uh, and then, so, so flip side, so specifically to space exploration, uh, you'd really like to be able to get rocket fuel out of the dust. So in particular, uh, I mean, we, we, we have to make things. Uh, uh, Basically, uh, in, in order to uh, to do this economically in space, mostly because like launch costs are really ridiculous, and and maybe the big, big Falcon rocket will make this better. But basically, at the moment, it's uh, uh, you know uh, a, a kilogram of stuff sitting in low Earth orbit basically costs the the planet as much as uh, uh, you know five kilograms of uh, of silver. So 
It's stuff that we would normally not think of as economical for for uh, uh, for steel, because for example, it would, I mean, on Earth we can just mix two kinds of rocks together and blow the the atmosphere through. Like that's as, that's as easy. We're never going to beat that, right? Uh, you can make steel for five hundred a ton. Uh, so so, so th th thinking about sort of like uh, anything as as being like uh, equivalent to a precious metal, so being able to invest, willing to invest the sort of like uh, uh, energy or sort of processing in in a steel part in, in space actually seems semi plausible. Uh, so I, I claim this is true literally anywhere in the solar system, including Alaska. Uh, it's kind of a surprising thing. So if, if you look at a micro photo, so this is uh, uh, basically uh, each. So this is two pictures side by side. Each one is about a millimeter across, and it's a zoom in on basalt dust. Uh, this is actually the sort of awful rock crusher dust that blows away from the uh, the rock crusher and uh, the North Pole basalt rock crusher. Uh, they, they use crushed basalt for uh, uh, road beds and uh, a lot of construction. It actually locks together really nicely. It's a really uniform, homogeneous material. Uh, and it's actually surprisingly similar, at, at least in the, uh, uh, I mean, geologists in the room are going to throw something at me, but uh, I claim basalt is pretty dang similar uh, across the solar system. Because it's mostly just sort of well mixed solar system stuff is, is the composition of stuff. So, for example, the uh, the Kennedy Space Center uses Black Point One as their lunar regolith simulant in this competition, and it's actually not an awful uh, regolith simulant in general. And if you look at a micrograph, it's pretty dang similar. Uh, the uh, the the let's see. So if you it, so the, the morphology is similar. In particular, it's got a ton of really tiny, so you, you can see lots of little tiny, uh, very light colored grains. These tend to be your feldspars, your quartzes, your things without like a lot of uh, uh, metals in them. And then these brightly colored or dark colored uh, 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 other, other grains of minerals that are, uh, uh, that, that's, that's where you're, uh, you, that's, that's the good stuff. So in particular, there's a lot of stuff that's more or less useless to us, right? That there's, there's a bunch of sort of light, uh, uh, there's, there's way more silicon than we can use, basically, in a lot of this stuff. Uh, but then there's, uh, there's definitely some very good stuff. So the, the olivine maybe is a little hard to actually crack into. But for example, magnetite, uh, hematite, like those are like double, those are in the percent quantities, uh, and that's just pretty much straight up iron uh, with uh, with oxygen on it. So that's uh, so so. You know, there's, uh, we can definitely get to these pretty easily, and in particular, getting to the sort of you know a, a few digits worth of, uh, of steel is fairly easy. There's often steels like uh, so, so that there, there's uh, isolated iron atoms floating around inside these other sort of uh, uh, crystals that uh, might be harder to crack into those, but. Uh, you know, honestly, there's a lot of dust. Uh, our mining robot can mine its own body weight in dust in about in under 10 minutes, right? So, however much you so if, if if we ship like a 40 kilogram rover, uh, then you can get 40 kilograms more dust in you know 10 minutes. So, honestly, the dust efficiency is not really quite as important. I mean, that, it's unlikely that you're going to run out of dust on the moon, for example. But there's just uh, there's, you know there's several you know uh, meters of it thick in places. So this is. Uh, 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 fairly fairly doable. Uh, the uh, the mineral grains actually seem to be slightly different. I couldn't find an actual percent breakdown. Uh, Encyclopedia Britannica lists the Theo. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to not attempt to pronounce that. Uh, so so basically, like the, the the minerals are slightly different, but uh, broadly it's the same. You've got a, you've got some some useful metals, and then you've got some silicates, and uh, there is definitely quite a lot of uh, again the uh, uh, sort of uh, magnesium, iron, uh, sort of silica. So you, useful stuff. So if if you look at it uh, on an elemental breakdown, basically what's in there, and and this is uh, this is actually mid ocean ridge basalt, which is the only one that I could find that's uh, uh, sort of. Uh, uh, Seems to be fairly uniform around the, around the planet, uh, and and has has really good uh, widely available numbers. The entire uh, uh, ocean floor is uh, this sort of uh, the, the, these basalts, and uh, it's slightly different. So in other words, uh, uh, scientists really you know, and geologists really care about the sort of factor of you know up to maybe two variation in the composition of these things. But actually, from my point of view, this basically says like, yeah, okay, Mars has twice as much iron as Earth, because uh, you know, actually, uh, Earth has way less iron uh, on the surface, because we have all this volcanism that keeps like, you know, iron, we keep losing iron to the core. 
Uh, so, so essentially, this is hardest to do on Earth, but it's really not that there's a factor of two maybe in there. Uh, uh, asteroids may be a uh, little less aluminum, a little less calcium for, again, the same exact reason. There's no volcanic cycle that's uh, recycling stuff. But, but uh, generally, to, so, so what this says to me is that basically it's actually surprisingly similar overall breakdown. Uh, and, and this is, this is kind of great because this means uh, up to the point where you really start uh, worrying about optimizing your industrial process, you can uh, proof of concept or, or, or sort of uh, making parts, we can make parts anywhere in the solar system if we can figure out how to make parts from basalt. Uh, so uh, as far as space exploration in particular, every one of these is usually listed as an oxide. And there is a lot of oxygen. It's, it's actually 30% oxygen in dust. If you can figure out some way to extract it. I mean, the problem is it's bound you know, to iron, for example. And uh, it's not, not at all obvious how to, how to get that out of there. Uh, rocket fuel is mostly oxidizer. Right? If you want to make rocket fuel, it, uh, there's actually proposals where you just ship the fuel part. And uh, yeah, I should say rocket propellant, I suppose. The, uh, uh, so, so propellant is fuel and oxidizer. Uh, the, the oxidizer is uh, uh, the heaviest part because oxygen is a you know, heavy, uh, uh, heavy atom. So uh, essentially, if, if you've got water, uh, so this is uh, you know, definitely on Earth, we have plenty of this stuff. Oxygen is not a, uh, it, there's no way we could sell oxygen on Earth because it's uh, you know, uh, all around us unless it was pure or we you know, happen to be making a ton of it. Uh, so, but uh, it, it turns out if you only have dry dust, like on the moon, being able to extract oxygen from that dry dust can actually really be like a, a game-changing sort of capability. Uh, it, it turns out essentially all of the, all of the metals are useful. Right. Uh, every one of these uh, these elements is uh, is something you can actually make stuff out of. So, so in particular, uh, you take uh, d just uh, basalt dust, you, you melt it down and stretch it out, and you have basalt fiber. And basalt fiber, you can it, you can actually replace rebar in uh, uh, concrete with it. It uh, you can replace uh, carbon fiber. Uh, the uh, that's not it's not real obvious. Uh, Apparently, my, my colored text is not uh, not as legible as it should be. Uh, so, so basically, uh, potential uses for all of these things. So in particular, if, if we could extract each of these, it would actually be great if we had some uh, scalable, useful process that starts with basalt dust and ends up with basically little piles of every element, ideally with oxygen in a separate pile. Uh, not at all clear how to, how to actually do that. Uh, one approach. So this is this is basically what I've been what I'm, I've been working at. This is sort of the main approach, is that uh, we dissolve the metal oxide in some, some sort of acid or some sort of electrolyte, and then we run an electric current through it. So so the, the idea here is that we're actually using the, the sort of plentiful solar power to uh, uh, to apply the energy you need to actually extract the oxygen and, and make it make it be a separate thing. So so the idea is we have some sort of an inert anode where oxygen gas is bubbling off, and then we have a cathode where basically metal is growing in my dark legible that is. That's probably hard to see, but there's a the, so idea is there's this uh, some, some sort of layer of metals actually growing on the cathode. And uh, essentially like you, uh, uh, surprisingly enough, a lot of acids can be regenerated, uh, like the, uh, uh, the brine, and, uh, brine electrolysis is the way that we make hydrofluoric acid uh, starting from salt. So, so it, it turns out the same process will basically, in, in particular here, if I start with water, H2O, I pull the oxygens off, I'm left with a bunch of spare hydrogens. That's that you know, extra hydrogens make the pH low. That's what uh, that's what makes acid acid. Uh, so, so so essentially, this uh, so, so I claim this one process actually seems surprisingly plausible, right? And there's, we we have we have essentially perfect uh, uh, charge balance, mass balance, etc. In in theory, the acid is just sort of a uh, uh, it's a catalyst. It lets you run the electric current through here, and it's not easily consumed doing this, right? So in theory, you should be able to make you know a, a ton quantities of uh, uh, of metals and and, and oxygen uh, using only you know kilograms potentially of acid, uh, and uh, ideally these anodes are pretty inert. There's uh, of course there's always some consumption rate of these things, and in practice, like for brine electrolysis, they've gotten it down to where it's like milligrams of anode per ton of acid. So that's that's sort of the ratios you want. So as you you know even if we can't figure out how to make inert anodes, these usually tend to be like uh, titanium coated in platinum or something really wacky. Uh, so, so even if these are expensive or shipped from Earth, like because they're not actually consumed, uh, you, uh, uh, you conceivably this thing could scale. C c questions about this? Have people done this? This is the basis of like electroplating. It's the basis of uh, a, a lot of other uh, uh, technologies out there. 
So, uh, and, and it's, it's, they've been doing it since the 1800s. So it's definitely something that we, we, know, we know how to do. It turns out almost any acid works for this. In fact, uh, almost any sort of uh, uh, ionic uh, liquid will work for this. So in particular, like sulfuric acid is what I've been playing with lately, mostly because it's, uh, th there's, there's no, sulfuric acid wants to, it freezes at about 10 centigrade. So it, it really wants to be a solid. It boils at 300 centigrade or something. So it, there's, there's no fumes coming off sulfuric, which uh, makes it very sort of friendly, friendly to work with. Uh, there is a ton of sulfate on Mars. There's like double digit percent quantities of sulfate. And, and in particular, like not, not just sulfur, which we have a lot of on Earth, but sulfate, so, so as it, that's oxidized sulfur. Uh, and uh, th th what this means is actually theoretically plausible. You take Mars dirt. You just shovel it into a bucket. You maybe fill it uh, with some extra water that you can extract there, stick your anodes in, and you may be able to you start by generating some sulfuric acid and then uh, immediately uh, uh, you know, uh, start extracting metals, which would, would be great. Uh, the big downside here is like calcium sulfate. Uh, that's gypsum, right? That's the, uh, this stuff is, is drywall. Right, uh, it 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 doesn't dissolve, and that's uh, that's a problem because if you're pers so essentially, uh, if I am adding sulfate, then it gets sequestered away as calcium sulfate, and then I have to re-extract my acid uh, before I can throw my tailings away. So that's that's a problem unless you have a ton of sulfate. Like on Mars, there's probably so much sulfate you could just say, yep, we're just you know we're just, my, our tailings are going to be packed with gypsum. That actually might make them useful as concrete, which would be great. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if uh, I think like on the moon this is maybe problematic because to, to crack calcium sulfate apart is like a thousand centigrade or more. It uh, and, and the, the, there's no obvious electrolytic way to do it. I, I don't know. Re recycling sulfuric is hard uh, with with the, because of the calcium sulfate thing. It turns out like calcium nitrate totally soluble. It actually, is, uh, all of the salts of nitric acid essentially are soluble, which is great. Uh, th there's a certain amount of ammonia. It, it, nitric is actually probably problematic on the moon. I, actually, all of these are problematic on the moon. Uh, asteroids uh, potentially have a lot of uh, 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 ammonia, and uh, ammonia oxidation is a great way to make nitric acid. Uh, you can, uh, uh, cool part about nitric acid is uh, at the end of the processing, I'm gonna end up with a bunch of like, uh, you know, sodium nitrate, calcium nitrate, a bunch of other, you know, alkalis that are sort of dissolved in there that I extracted from the, uh, fr from the, from the rock. And uh, I can actually regenerate nitric acid thermally. So it, at a pretty reasonable temperature of 180 C, it actually starts emitting this awful brown gas that uh, uh, basically, uh, I, I bubble it through water and I basically get nitric acid really cheap. Uh, this is also a huge downside of sulfuric is that uh, the contact process is needed to regenerate sulfuric acid from, like if I start with sulfur, it's easy enough to burn sulfur to make sulfur dioxide, but then uh, reoxidizing that takes these enormous uh, contact process towers, which are just a, it, industrial, it's a pain in the butt. Uh, uh, high temperatures, it has a really long uh, uh, reaction time. Nitric is super easy to regenerate. Uh, I'm not actually totally sure this would work with nitric, but nitric is one that I've not tried with this. So this is, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not clear to me that you could actually keep like uh, iron reduced because nitric really wants to oxidize things. It's great. Uh, and, and then hydrochloric is actually used commercially on Earth. Uh, you can dissolve literally any metal in the periodic table basically with uh, hydrochloric, which is great, uh, exception of silver, I guess. Uh, a, a couple of them uh, form, form complexes. So, so if, if you want to dissolve platinum group metals, you pretty much got to use hydrochloric acid. Uh, hydrochloric acid is, uh, it's great if you have brine. You can do brine electrolysis, so you know, on the Earth, on Mars, this is perfect. On the moon or asteroids, it's not, there's actually surprisingly little chlorine in the solar system. Uh, so, so doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily work that, that well. The big problem on Earth actually is that you get chlorine gas instead of oxygen gas bubbling off. So it's you know uh, this poison if just you know uh, uh, flammable explosive. It's uh, it's nasty stuff. So uh, pick a mineral acid. Uh, d dissolve your your uh, your metals in, into ions that are sort of just floating around in the uh, uh, in, in the solution. So th this is sort of the magical diagram that makes uh, all of electrolysis work. Uh, called a Pourbaix diagram. So the the x-axis is the pH of the of the electrolyte. The y-axis is the voltage that you apply. So uh, the uh, the dotted lines, which are strangely enough sloped, is the stability region for water. So essentially, if the if the voltage is higher than this, you start getting bubbles of oxygen bubbling off the anode. If if the voltage is lower than this, you start getting bubbles of hydrogen bubbling off the uh, the cathode. So, so you notice most metals in a slightly oxidizing low pH environment are their ions. They're floating around uh, uh, independently, which is great. 
So this is what we said. We, we, we want to basically like, get uh, get ions out of uh, 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 out of our minerals. So if if we basically have a low pH uh, operating environment, uh, aqueous solution. This and and, and I mean I, I've I've sort of uh, isolated most of the minerals that we're interested in. Uh, let's see, the uh, so, so so essentially the 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 area that we that we really uh, that we really care about is right there. It'd actually be really great to be able to do this uh, and. Uh, and get all the way down into here to electro deposits like aluminum and magnesium. The big problem is this right here. So uh, if, if I try and have uh, a sufficiently big voltage to start electro depositing aluminum, the problem is I'm getting so much hydrogen bubbling off that the hydrogen starts reacting with aluminum, and it's, it's basically considered impossible to have a water-based solution that's electro depositing anything very far below here. Now, you notice iron is actually below this line. So sort of in theory, this shouldn't work. We should get hydrogen instead of iron. But uh, the closer you are to the line, the, uh, uh, y y you're actually getting some hydrogen bubbling off, but uh, you actually also get some metal getting deposited. So this hurts your current efficiency somewhat. And you're, you're splitting water by if, if, you, if you go outside the lines. Uh, and uh, so surprisingly enough, actually, um, um, you get solid magnetite that deposits on the, uh, the anode, which so you can actually do double duty here with both both electrodes are uh, are are actually uh, getting iron on them, which is kind of surprising. It does not seem uh, uh, like uh, like what you would expect. And then if, if you just have the pH trip down low, then it uh, it dissolves off, and then you can you can actually uh, uh, deposit the uh, deposit the iron again. So super close up of that region, and and this is uh, I've been I've been staring at this so long it makes perfect sense to me. This I don't know what it looks like from the outside. This looks like one of those. Uh, okay, I need yarn. Wonderful thing it lasts. So the basic idea is, uh, if you're in here, which is basically like pH is about zero, like it's really acidic, and it's slightly oxidizing, all the metals are in solution. And then if I start applying a voltage, the first thing that plates out is copper, and the next thing that plates out is nickel, and then I get vanadium oxide, you have vanadium oxide and cobalt, and uh, you, can, you have solid vanadium if you get pH really low, and then eventually you get iron. So basically, if I just run electric current through here, I'm going to plate all of these things out, uh, which, okay, that's cool. Now, it turns out there's, there's not that much, I mean, there's, very, there's like parts per million copper, nickel, uh, uh, cobalt, and, and madden, et cetera, that there's not that much of those things. Uh, yeah? I was just wondering if anybody has done electrolysis of uh, direct phosphorus, because of all the mineral forms. Yeah. If yeah. you normally mine sure. what happens before electrolyzing, it goes through <laughs> several chemical processes. Yeah. The yeah. Mineral yeah. Of choice yeah. Is accessible to this. Yeah. Now, the salt is in mineral form with all kinds of other chemistry. Yeah. 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 So, I was just yeah. It, uh, so, so, so th there's, uh, there's definitely been some work. On it. I mean, th th this is like the most cartoonish kid version of mining, right? I literally take raw dust off the surface of the planet, I dump it into my, my processing, and there we go. Like, so, so it, it actually seems kind of implausible this would work at all. Uh, but surprisingly enough, this is actually what makes it work, right? So aluminum is not going to electro deposit because it's way too far down. It just keeps, it, it'll stay in your electrolysis forever. Same deal with magnesium, uh, right? But uh, uh, you know, manganese or something. So, so there's a bunch of stuff that's just going to stay in your electrolyte. Uh, there's just not enough. I, I mean, it'd be cool if there's more copper. I mean, nickel is actually beautiful for this. So commercially, uh, th th this is definitely a thing that people do that they will, you know, electroform metals, and uh, it tends to be a lot of nickel alloys, a lot of maybe nickel cobalt alloys, because you notice like they're they're sort of uh, you're not really fighting the hydrogen uh, evolution that much in the electrodes, but it's uh, it's 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 pretty doable. The problem is there's just almost no nickel sort of available, right? That uh, it's it's just an extremely rare uh, uh, element in the uh, in in these metals. So, uh, so, so essentially, like uh, uh, as I electro deposit down there, uh, it, 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 there, there are other kind of weird things about this that uh, I probably need to stop talking about. Uh, Fe three. So, so th th there's actually two different uh, uh, states for iron, right? So there's Fe three, which is sort of closer to being it's, it's, this is the reduced form of iron. It's a lot easier to turn it into actual uh, iron metal. Uh, Fe three is this angry red uh, form of iron. Uh, actually, the uh, if, if you look at like rust, r rust often has uh, uh, some some Fe3 uh, uh, oxidation state in there, and uh, I don't know. Iron also has a bunch of hydroxides and stuff that I'm not showing here. But uh, essentially, uh, Fe3 is so corrosive it will actually like oxidize copper, right? So it'll it'll uh, put copper into solution so that it can reduce itself. 
uh, it, that's that's how how reactive it is. So I think actually uh, uh, Fe three is sort of, and we're sort of uh, in this oxidizing environment at the anode. We are generating Fe three, right? Uh, and, and, and in particular, we're actually ticking off a bunch of other metals, like putting them into this sort of really angry. I mean, we're we're emitting oxygen, for example. Uh, so, so, so there's, uh, the, the, there's uh, uh, I feel like there's actually a lot of opportunity here to use Fe3 as sort of, a, you know, this, uh, this super acid that, uh, that's going to basically eat the, uh, eat the rocks. So, uh, again, just uh, the, the, the reason to focus on steel is mostly because of the poor body diagram. I know I can electrodeposit steel, right? It, it's, it's at least theoretically plausible. It's a little hard to do. Actually, the higher the pH gets, the better it is, right? The, the, the closer these two lines get together. So ideally, you'd be doing this at, uh, I don't know, in the, in the three or four. It gets hard to actually keep any, anything sort of just in solution at that. Uh, it, it, wants to, it wants to play it out as magnetite, unfortunately. Uh, so, so essentially, st uh, steel is plausible. Now, of course, uh, somebody is going to say, it's not steel, it's iron. Well, you know, if, if I take iron and then I have a little bit of nickel in it, it's not considered iron anymore. It's considered uh, uh, steel. And in particular, uh, I mean, uh, uh, we're going to get all of the sort of alloying elements that, uh, that make this thing steel. So I, I feel like it's not crazy to call it steel. Uh, and, and, and you can actually add other elements, right? So for example, uh, you might be able to add a little bit of selective uh, oxidation to uh, basically make the steel harder. If, if you want mostly abrasion resistant stuff, then uh, oxygen, sulfate inclusions. I really want to try this. Uh, I, 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 uh, I had a case where essentially I was electrodepositing metal around uh, uh, fabric, and the metal grew through the fabric, so that I had sort of a, a fabric metal composite. Which I, I mean, there's no other way to make that than to sort of like uh, assemble the metals atom by atom on, around the fabric. So, so essentially, so he, he, here's here's the here's the overall process, right? And this is. Uh, this is the one pot process. So I just literally dump my basalt in this side, and this is a horrible mess of like angry, you know, oxidizing uh, the iron, etc. And then to, to, uh, I've got oxygen bubbling through here. The oxygen bubbles are great because it actually like mixes this thing up automatically, <laughs> uh, which is uh, kind of fun. Uh, the pH ideally is below zero, which is debatable whether that's even theoretically possible. Like as many hydrogens as you can fit in there. That's, uh, uh, so uh, again, the, uh, the your anode has to survive this, right? It, it's basically sitting there in the midst of all of this corrosive reactive stuff, and it uh, uh, it has to not dissolve as well. So typically, like a platinum and iridium, and it literally does nothing except just like this is where electrons uh, uh, basically get sucked out of the, the solution, and then you know, that neutralizes oxygen that basically uh, fall off. Uh, ideally, the, the metal ions, all of them, unfortunately, are kind of coming this way. And uh, then the, they uh, they build up and, and, and they literally so in other words uh, the, the, the cathode is where we're basically depositing electrons on those neutralize the positive charge on the metals and they, right, reduce the metals down and eventually you get actually literally a solid chunk of steel coming out. So that's the theory. Now in practice, a uh, couple weird things happen if you do this. So I uh, I get some white. Is. This is where my lack of sort of analytic chemistry is definitely showing. I, I, for the longest time, I thought it was sulfate, but uh, I think I could do all the usual things you can do with sulfate, like roast off the sulfuric acid. I couldn't. And I realized, like, oh, maybe it's actually like uh, little bits of like silicon dioxide. It, uh, it's actually extremely annoying stuff because it's, I, I believe it's literally like isolated, like one silicon with a few oxygens around it. Like, uh, it's virtually impossible to filter. Right. It's this appallingly thin stuff, and it, uh, it kind of, you know, it's all over the place. Uh, if you measure the pH, the pH is literally lower over here on the anode side than it is on the cathode. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's the anode. Uh, see, so so uh, this turns green, which is great. We can actually see Fe2 versus Fe3. If it turns red or black, you know that it's either uh, magnetite or uh, 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 Fe3, which is a real problem. So uh, basic basic idea here is that the, uh, and I have, I, I don't know how I messed these up. So that is that is the anode, that is the cathode. Uh, so, so essentially, this is uh, this is the positive terminal. That's the negative terminal. And I, I literally do grow a little layer of steel on there. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, qu qu questions about this thing. So this is 
This is the only piece of steel that I made, which I immediately tested out uh, to, uh, like, you know, uh, did some chemical analysis, did some mechanical tests, uh, and uh, it, it, this, this piece doesn't exist anymore, which is frustrating. I, I have this, which I, I electrodeposited uh, with a, basically, a steel anode. Uh, so that essentially, rather than cracking the atoms out of the salt, then I was uh, 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 making them uh, basically just st starting from uh, scrap steel. So, so was, uh, you, you can totally electrodeposit these things. I'll pass this around. And uh, it, it, it's definitely doable. Uh, uh, you, you, hydrogen evolution is competing with the d deposition of the steel, so my current efficiency is actually kind of, it's, it's basically crap with this one. I think it was 30%. Uh, but, uh, but, but, uh, but presumably if you, if you uh, tweak this some more, you could, you could actually optimize it. I have actually been, I'm unable to duplicate this. I, I, what I was trying to do is I was trying to actually run to exhaustion. So get to the point, so the top layer of this is white. I've essentially extracted most of the metals uh, from from the uh, uh, from the basalt, but uh, at the bottom there's still a bunch of black material left. Which ideally, so if, ideally to do this more scientifically, I would have uh, like X-ray refraction spectroscopy. So I'd know the elemental composition going in. I'd know the elemental composition of this weird white stuff. I'd know the elemental composition of the metal I'm depositing, etc. Cetera, et cetera. I don't I don't uh, have that stuff yet. Uh, this is this is, uh, uh, but but I, I was able to successfully electroform stuff, literally starting from dust, which actually seems super exciting to me, right? Uh, it, it, because this is like this is so non-capital intensive, right? That this is like a Walmart jar with a 3D printed sort of thing to hold this uh, uh, the, the electrolyte separator in place, and uh, let's see, th this is like a, it's, I believe it began life as a refrigerator door or something, right? It's just a chunk of stainless. And then the only part that I had to buy was this eBay like anode to uh, uh, to do the uh, electrodepositing. Super uh, su su super low uh, uh, so, so sort of low investment. What's that? What was the eBay anode? Uh, the e eBay anode was like uh, eight bucks or something. I mean, it's, it's 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 made of it's, it's made of titanium with a super micro thin layer of platinum. Yeah, platinum. So yeah, so so the, the idea is that uh, so dust straight from dust to an, an electroform. Now now this is really easy to make sheets, right? And and uh, so I, I can electroform sheets of stuff. So I've, I'm passing the one around. Uh, sheets. In fact, this is the, the I mean, uh, electrolytically refined copper is kind of the standard thing. Copper is great for this, as you saw from the core diagram. The copper doesn't really, it doesn't want to be oxidized, right? It's, it's a lot more oxidation resistant. Whereas steel just wants to. You can see my steel is. Horribly, like covered in rust. Uh, so, so th th these are some electroformed copper pieces, and uh, if you look at the edges, you can actually see the layer lines where I had a 3D print. Uh, so, so this is this uh, uh, sort of a non-conductive guide that just keeps the electrolyte from reaching the deposit. So as you can shape the deposit, which is actually kind of an interesting thing. So this is the, the little L and O uh, that, that basically, like, I'm growing it onto a sheet of stainless. And I'm blocking parts of it, and uh, my 3D print apparently wasn't completely watertight because it didn't. It, uh, these started growing these bizarre dendritic uh, uh, things on them. Uh, so, so th th there are there are some challenges. So here, here's the stuff I've been fighting lately, and this is why I don't have a. Uh, I, 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 I have this uh, beautiful little 3D printed helical gear with a uh, you know an index and stuff. Like if conceivably, this could be a usable part uh, in a robot. Uh, so he, here, here's why I don't have that. So you, you start with basically this nice, beautiful, uniform metal solution. You know, I'm running electric current through it, and the electric current, the electric feels uniform because I'm depositing into a flat plate. The problem is, uh, as soon as as soon as basically uh, the uh, uh, you start depositing a non-zero amount of stuff, you, you get uh, two effects. Like one is that there's this gradient of, of the uh, the concentration. So as we, we've actually consumed most of the ions around the part we're depositing. And then the electric field is doing the same thing. The electric field is concentrating on the sharpest pieces. So actually, this little tiny pinprick of uh, deposited copper that reaches through my uh, uh, through this uh, uh, this form, th that actually has an appallingly high electric field, right? And and the, the electric field intensity is extremely strong around that point. So it, it, in fact, uh, uh, you get preferential deposition around the edges. And then the bigger the edges get, the sharper, in particular. Uh, and, and, and further sticking out, then the, 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 these, these actually just make it worse, right? That they, uh, they, they, there's feedback effect happening here. So, so the, uh, the, the, the annoying part is that like the middle actually, it grows slower and slower, which uh, makes it hard to build, uh, uh, build up big things. Uh, I, 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 uh, 
I definitely need to have a lot more work to do here where actually some sort of circulation, I probably need, I, I can't just rely on the bubbling. I was, I was hoping I could have that level of like, there's literally no pumps, no filtering, no nothing. That doesn't really seem to make a very good deposit. You, you, you certainly can get a certain amount of uh, material. It, it seems like, you know, the first millimeter or so, this effect isn't that bad. Once you get start getting to sort of more macroscopic scale objects, it's kind of hard to fight this instability. And uh, it really wants to grow these wacky looking like tree-like dendrites. Uh, and, and in particular, the uh, uh, annoying part is that uh, if I have the current density sufficiently low, I grow just a flat, uniform surface, which is actually a strong ductile piece of metal. Uh, if, if I'm growing faster than that, essentially you get these little undulations that kind of start, I mean, you tend to, it, it ends up leaving little cracks in between the, uh, the deposits. It can actually look relatively okay. It's that, you know, these are like microscopic scale. And the problem is there's just no, like the electric field is, is like deconcentrated in, in the middle of the cracks. It's really hard for fresh ions to get down in there, so they don't self heal, which is frustrating. Uh, th th there are these wacky organic acids, like this sulfamic acid, and uh, they're basically just this giant, like, uh, a half polar molecule, so they tend to like, have some other wacky, uh, something or other, with, uh, with some sort of charge, and it's going to bind itself onto the surface of the high point. And it's actually just going to block the high point deposition. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know, it's some, some good ideas are definitely needed here. It's, it's possible like a uh, uh, more mechanical, like a, uh, if I took maybe a bunch of that non-conductive dust and had it be circulating against there, maybe it would help block the high points. Maybe that wouldn't work at all. Maybe it'd cram into the low points. Uh, so, so, so some sort of circulation. It, uh, you can actually fix it electrically where you just switch the current uh, density and that preferentially, like the, that, that makes this uh, charge concentration work against the high points. So uh, yeah, it uh, not not totally clear how to scale very far up uh, past the millimeter level, but you know a, a couple of millimeter thick sheet is how most sh uh, sheet steel actually is is sold nowadays. Uh, so so you could totally build you know uh, uh, casings, you could build like wear plates, you could potentially build things like cutting edges. Depends on how uh, far you can get with making you know uh, improving the hardness of the stuff. Uh, it, it, it's actually a little surprising, like even just you know cutter teeth or something. Even if they were way worse than something you would import from Earth, if you can make them yourself, then this is uh, potentially a, 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 you know, more economical to do that. So th there are a million and one unknowns. Like, how do, you, how do you scale this up to having an actual sort of industrial scale operation? I, I don't know. Step one, I pretty much got nailed, though. But uh, <laughs> there's, there's basalt everywhere. Uh, yeah, I mean, p so p pick an acid, pick a concentration, uh, pick uh, p pick the pH range you want to maintain, and, and really there's a sort of two pHs there, right? There's pH on, on both sides. You could conceivably, like, uh, uh, to the extent you want to keep them uh, different, you could be injecting uh, uh, more stuff. Uh, the uh, uh, temperature range, yeah, you got to figure that out. Current density is really important as far as, like, uh, you know, the less current, the less metal you're depositing, but the smoother it your deposit tends to get. Un unless uh, your current density is too low, in which case basically the uh, the stuff is oxidizing as fast as you're depositing, you, know, you get nothing. Uh, so so d uh, d dendritic growth, maybe we add some sort of brightener, uh, you, you deposit at some rate, metal composition comes out to I don't know what, like you get a total yield of something or other, you, you, and, you know, to, to actually be useful either in space or industrially or on, you know, uh, in, in Alaska, you really need to know what the total life cycle of the acid is. And it really can't be like, yeah, we order it from Earth and we use it one time and then we just make it leaves with the tailings. That's not, that's not going to work. Uh, so, so, so you have to have almost perfect regeneration unless it's something like, uh, like sulfuric is nice because there's, there's a surprising amount of sulfur, uh, sulfates in the, uh, uh, all, all over the place. Uh, so, oh, wow. My screensaver came on. Uh, you, you can, in fact, deposit steel. Okay, let's do this. Yes. What? No, nothing's wrong. Why would anything be wrong? <laughs> uh, so uh, here, here's the answers that I know so far works. So dissolving sulfuric acid, which is uh, I literally just use battery acid because it, it's very clean. There's, there's no, it, uh, and, and cheap. Uh, pH is somewhere around one. 
temperature uh, higher is much better as far as like smooth iron deposits. Uh, this is actually it's probably because sulfuric really is about to freeze at about 10 degrees centigrade, so the the, the warmer the better. Uh, it, 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 surprisingly enough, with sulfuric acid, you can ha you can actually run them at like 180 C. That's totally legit. That's totally a thing. It's not boiling yet because it's sulfuric acid. Uh, get current density, like one amp per square decimeter is uh, pretty typical units for that, uh, which is actually annoyingly low. Uh, I added some tartaric acid, which I'm not sure if it actually helped or not, but uh, I, I did. My deposition rate is awful. <laughs> 0.1 millimeters a day. So in other words, if you want a one millimeter thick object, it's going to take like a week or two. That's that's that's, that's problematic. It, uh, it so so industrially, the way they do this is uh, they, they 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 have managed to basically balance the system where they get higher deposition rates. But they also just have they you know if 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 I want like a you know one centimeter thick uh, uh, copper sheet. You know, it's going to take a certain amount of time to do that. If I if I want to scale up the number of copper sheets I'm making, I just stack them side by side by side in these enormous long 40 foot long tanks, and then I have giant you know uh, bridge cranes that are basically just picking up like you know uh, 100 sheets at a time. So essentially, like you can you can parallelize this process, and I could imagine having a swimming pool filled with sulfuric acid at 70 degrees centigrade at pH one, and uh, it's just sitting there like sucking down enormous amounts of electric current, just making the spare parts for the whole you know Mars base, Moon base. Etc. Uh, my metal composition, I, I don't know yet. It, uh, yeah, uh, to total, total yield, I, I have gotten two percent metal out of basalt, which actually, you know, That's honestly, is, uh, is doesn't seem terribly bad. Uh, it's uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I've not been able to get more than that yet. But uh, literally, I've, I've done this once. This has worked over Christmas. Uh, I have not even attempted thermal reprocessing yet. Uh, cool part about sulfate is that it's not really poisonous to humans or plants, uh, other than the pH. So you neutralize it, and you would basically like uh, it, you should be able to grow plants in it, which I would like to attempt. I mean, I think that would be kind of a fun thing. In particular, you've probably removed a bunch of heavy metals from it because you're like, all right, heavy metals, great. Uh, it turns out ferrous sulfate is like this nice sort of mild green stuff that you use for plant food. So it's, uh, it's, it's semi-plausible. Uh, th this doesn't work as well with like uh, if, if I do hydrochloric acid, then I get this awful like salty you know uh, stuff that's probably full of dioxins and uh, it's probably not quite as good uh, for for plants or or people or or anything. Ah, <laughs> uh, right. So y you might notice that uh, this is the computer science department. So why on earth am I doing this? A question I've asked myself several times. So, I, so one huge difference here. Uh, experiments in computer science are really, really easy. I didn't realize how easy they were until I started doing something where I actually have to set up stuff in the lab. Uh, right? It, uh, uh, so in other words, I, I'm used to be able to do 1,000 experiments per second, uh, which is great. Uh, I, can re I can do perfect replication of experiments. Uh, which is, uh, yeah, so, so being able to check things in, being able to make perfect free copies of things that, uh, that's nice. And uh, uh, basically, like, uh, you know, it takes at least days to get anything. And uh, what I've been fighting, so basically around Christmas, I get this amazing present of being able to de like to deposit steel from dust. And I'm like, that's awesome. Let me try to increase the current density. I get no deposit. Let me try to see if I can increase the conductivity of electrolyte by adding uh, uh, basically uh, uh, sodium sulfate. That does nothing. Like, I'm like, oh, let me back off the current density to what I had exactly before, but I still have the, so I've mixed in uh, 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 sulfate now. So I'm, I'm just stuck with that. I think I killed my electrolyte by trying to make it better. So yeah, git revert. So I, 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 I have the protocol at least uh, stored for how I can reproduce this, I think. Uh, but th then like, I, I don't know which of these aspects are actually really crucial. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to make experiments in this sort of thing a lot easier to do. So in particular, like automated chemistry stuff, where some sort of robots that are running experiments on this stuff would be really great. And in particular, being able to just sort of do like a pH sweep, maybe 3D print a little uh, electrolyte container where I can, I can test like 10 different pHs at a time, but I deal with the same kind of electronic uh, uh, driver setup. And then it should be relatively easy to, uh, to test out different brighteners and things that way, in particular if I can do experiments in parallel. Uh, it, 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 uh, it's definitely super promising to actually combine 3D printing with uh, uh, with this stuff because uh, you know I can guide electrolyte or I, I can guide the deposition of, of deposit. I can. Uh, 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 it turns out ABS plastic survives basically pH zero at 80 C indefinitely, which is kind of surprising to me. Uh, 
Right. So uh, uh, th th there's actually a whole, a whole uh, field of chemistry called steric chemistry that uh, basically it's just based on sizes. It's very computer graphics. -y. So in particular, so things tend to be unstable if the little ion in the middle is uh, smaller than the hole for it. So uh, basically, you can you can do cer certain degree of uh, stability analysis by just uh, with ge geometry. So it'd, it'd be fun, interesting to do. Uh, I actually have been looting a bunch of stuff from the materials project. So this is a uh, uh, basically like uh, all my probiotic diagrams uh, started at the materials project. So I was looking at molybdenum. And uh, it, uh, it turns out, I think I can electrode and deposit molybdenum if you can keep it in solution. It's a pretty tiny little sort of acidic solution. Uh, uh, it doesn't, doesn't want to be an ion except for a very small region there. So I, 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 don't, I'm, I, I don't know how much molybdenum there is in there, but I, I know they, they use that for like meringing steel. So let's see. So uh, yeah, so, so lots of interesting options there. In particular, like stability calculations are how this, that's where this comes from, right? So we know the metal is stable at this, uh, at, at this location relative to that by basically just doing this uh, stability calculation. So, so uh, you know, there's the, that, that, that's sort of already uh, enabled figuring out how, how to actually pull this stuff off. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is like, theoretically, you should be able to directly mine stuff and make metal parts. And uh, I mean, the capital investment, I, I believe I have like $30 <laughs> invested in my whole setup, right? So there's like a $3 Walmart jar. There's a, literally a scrap of stainless steel that I pulled off of a refrigerator door. There's, uh, there's one $6 eBay anode, and then there's a current source. Like, there's, there's just not that much there. Uh, and and uh, I'm able to go straight from dust into, uh, uh, into, into metal parts, which actually is, seems, seems surprising that that's even possible. Uh, figuring out how to scale it up is really hard. And, and I, I think we can actually probably give up on like coal-fired blast furnace, because like anytime, you, anytime your competitors are starting with rocks, they, like there's no electricity involved. There's, uh, it's a, they're doing a volume type reaction instead of a surface type reaction, which is sort of inherent to this kind of uh, electric deposition stuff. They're just going to win as far as like pumping out the tons of, of stuff. Uh, but uh, but if you know if uh, uh, you know totally carbon free and, and this is there's not only there's no carbon emissions. There's literally zero carbon in the steel, I believe, uh, just just because the right the. the Carbon is not really this aqueous thing; it's going to electro deposit that way. So, so you, you you may end up being able to do specialty alloys or something, uh, in particular making like these uh, you know high high quality parts, at least in theory. Could be a market on Earth. Uh, definitely seems like there would be a market in in space. To uh, uh, in, in other words, th this seems super promising to me that I could take something that literally would fit on a CubeSat and uh, uh, plunk it down on any planetary surface and conceivably uh, uh, you know. Uh, make new parts for, for new CubeSats, or the CubeSat could be the seed that then grows into an entire sprawling chemical uh, complex. Uh, it totally seem, seems plausible. And uh, it, it, the, the surprising thing to me is that uh, finding these answers, and, and uh, this is something people have been, right, smart people have been working on these problems for like, uh, you know, over a hundred years, and uh, we're still sort of stuck in the Edison era, I feel like, in a lot of chemistry. We're just like, well, let's just try all the possible ways of doing things rather than sort of being able to rationally kind of predict uh, what's going to happen. Uh, so, so, so the hope is that with software we should be able to uh, uh, at least guide the search for, uh, uh, for, for better, better approaches. Uh, my 0.1 millimeters a day is 16 layers of atoms per second. So we should be able to do better than that. It definitely seems like uh, that does not seem like as fast as we should be able to go. Question? Yeah. Hydrogen embrittlements. That may be a problem. You, you may actually have to take the steel parts out, uh, put them in front of the solar furnace, and bake the hydrogen out. Definitely possible. Yeah. Yeah. If you've got bubbling form right on the hydrogen, yeah. hydrogen yeah. being attracted right in the middle of the yeah. steel parts. In fact, yeah. that may actually be causing problems because it should be um, yeah. affecting I, I, uh, it, it cur the current efficiency being 30% indicates that I'm definitely losing a lot of uh, sort of e either steel or electrons somewhere. I don't think there's quite that much hydrogen. I, 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 ideally, I would be measuring those things. The, the, the steel plate that I passed around is actually not like uh, appallingly brittle, right? But it's, it's, it is a chunk of steel. You can grind it. It does seem like you could make a knife out of it. It'd be okay. Uh, the main, main thing would be that you would probably want in a, in a range where you keep the hydrogen level 
Well, you know, uh, what I re so long term, water is probably not the right material to use. Actually, in particular, picking a solvent that has no hydrogen could conceivably allow us to go all the way to uh, uh, to d down to this region. region. And in particular, like MIT's been working on this sort of uh, uh, like a, a chloride electrolysis where they're, uh, uh, they're able to deposit uh, electrolyte deposits uh, aluminum, and it says they don't use like, there's no hydrogen. And, and conceivably, you actually have this, I can still have like the sulfuric, uh, the sulfate could be one of the ions there. But I just do like this, you know, sodium salt. Actually, there's, there's a ton of like uh, ionic salts, ionic liquids. A, a lot of them tend to be high temperature or kind of reactive, but uh, kind of reactive is actually good when we're trying to like tear apart rocks. So this is conceivably, conceivably a, a feature. Okay, good question. Yeah? I just have comments. I think it's fantastic you're doing this. Yeah, it's been really yeah, fun. I, 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 I can't make myself stop working yeah. on it. No, I mean, I think that, you know, there is one metallurgist that's running a small company called Alphabet, right? So, huh. the yeah. there is this other link between uh, But that is right. So, I have, you know, uh, one of the things is silica might create problems, right? Yeah. I think the acid will dissolve, will melt silica. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if there's fluorine available or, or I just, uh, fluorine is more rare than uh, than yeah, uh, than chlorine, but yes. Yeah, uh, so yeah. I just thought I'd mention. And yeah. the second thing is, uh, you know, in, in mining, one of the biggest costs of mining is is grinding the rock into mm. particles. If you're already yeah. starting with yeah. fine powder, you yeah. already have economic yeah. standards to use. Yeah. Well, and uh, it so so. so Th th there is a good question, kind of, this, it's this intermediate stage. So we know, like, I could literally, if I could get a CubeSat to Mars and land it in the, in the middle of one of these big craters, there's just acres of this windblown dust that's just already appallingly fine and, like, that's just ready to go, basically. Yeah, and uh, right there, the yeah. is already looking yeah. pretty good. Yeah. The second thing is, when you, or, or the final thing I was going to say is, a lot of the answers that you see, what happens is when you try to scale them up, you look at mining, like in the lab that Bose is doing, yeah. These are like ten dollar experiments. Yeah. But the same thing in the field is a two hundred million dollar investment because yeah. by the time you want to bring a controlled product at the other end, you have to solve all those little problems that you're encountering. Yeah. And and then of course you have to do them at millions of times, right? Yeah. And so that's where it happens yeah. is that it, at this scale they are quite cheap. Yeah. And by the time you answer the question and then say, Well, I need a million times, yeah. now it becomes a Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it, it's a good question. So at the moment for space exploration, I mean, missions literally end, like the, you know, the Mars rovers, like once their wheels break, that's just it. Like there's no new source of wheels except on Earth, right? So it's a whole nother mission to like deliver new wheels. So, so some, and, and, and uh, I, I feel like in the, the sort of, uh, you know, th there's gonna be Mars missions where basically like there's a gear to keep stripping and like, if we just had a some supplier like where we could like you know every week we're stripping a new gear like the mission you know everyone would be able to stay <laughs> and otherwise we just have to flee the planet because like we keep stripping that tank gear and if we don't have an efficient way to make the gear then it just doesn't it just happen. It needs to work good enough, right? Yeah, it yeah. Have to match everything yeah. And maybe yeah. the properties we need get a little bit different. Yeah, the, sure. The yeah. environment. Is yeah. But, and, and it's surprising because you could imagine actually saying like, well, we're just going to burn some nickel on this one. And we're going to make the, you know, the, the nickel steel alloy that's going to be stronger for that batch because we, you know, we, need, we need more, uh, more strength for that, that part. What? Cool. Yeah, if anybody knows somebody with an a, a, a XRF, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need to, yeah, I need to take some samples in. It's uh, uh, it's in the microns. It, it, I mean, the, 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 there's a whole distribution. I think it's it's. I believe it's centered around 100 micron, like the mass fraction.